So my dad's last Christmas with us before he passed away, he asked for something. And what he asked for was an iPad. And the reason he wanted an iPad, the first thing that he learned to do on that iPad was use FaceTime. And the reason he wanted to learn FaceTime is because his kids and his grandkids lived all over Canada. And that was his way to constantly be able to see them, not just to be on the phone with them, but to actually be able to see them, to watch them grow up to develop this. And there's something really powerful about that thought. And what my parents taught me was that technology was not meant to replace face-to-face interaction. It was meant to enhance it. And how I watch my parents have used FaceTime when my mom calls my kids and how excited they all are to see each other and how they like, you know, know each other in totally different ways because we have this access, because we have this. It really taught me that this technology that we use, you know, you watching or you listening to this right now, hopefully me sharing these stories, it shows you how technology can actually bring us together, you know, as humans, if we use it that way. And this is why I really appreciated talking to Stacey Roshan, who wrote the book Tech with Heart. She does a wonderful job talking about why this is so important, developing compassion. How do we develop empathy in our students and how do we really use the technology to build relationships with our students, for them to build relationships with one another and around the world and with other educators. And that's how Stacey and I met was actually through Twitter. We've actually never met in person, um, but we've known each other for a long time because of the way that we use these spaces. And so it, it was a great conversation. I know you're going to really appreciate it. Stacey is absolutely wonderful. Check out her book, Tech with Heart. It's actually in the link below. But welcome back to another episode of The Innovator's Mindset. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the episode of The Innovator's Mindset podcast. I am so blessed to have Stacey Roshan here. We just had a wonderful podcast talking about three questions she took my last question and threw it back and changed it and did an amazing job and so i really appreciate that thoughtfulness in in the work that you do and um as i mentioned in the, the earlier podcast stacy someone i've known forever and i'm kind of disappointed because we've never met but i didn't know if we didn't meet because we just kind of have been in the same circles we've kind of been in the same places and i just feel that i know you and i think that really kind of talks to who you are as a person that you use technology and you are just such a warm, uh, inviting person. Whereas sometimes I think, um, you know, people are just like, it's almost like people are avatars. Do you know what I mean? Like they're just, they're maybe, I don't know if you know multiverse stuff, that stuff freaks me out a little bit, but I, I feel like, you know, that you're like a three dimensional, person that I've known forever. So it was a little bit weird when you said to me that we actually haven't met because I swear we have. And maybe we did, and you just don't remember me. Maybe I'm just a, not a memorable person. So maybe that's what the issue is, right? But it's just, it's, it, it, you totally lead by example. And so uh, Stacy has a wonderful book out called Tech with Heart. She is a world-class presenter. Uh, she's got the virtual stuff down, which is absolutely incredible because it, it takes, it is an adjustment, that's for sure. So Stacy, if you just kind of introduce yourself, tell us a little, about, uh, a little bit about who you are, what you do today, and how you got to that point, that'd be a great way to start. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm just so pumped to be here and be talking with you. So um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my biggest message and my biggest goal and why I'm interested in technology in the first place is really that idea of empowering every voice, really understanding and creating more equitable and empowering classrooms for all students. I talk a lot about my personal journey and my who I've become as a teacher was inspired by who I was as a student, which I think many of us can relate to that. I was very much that introverted student, that perfectionist in the classroom. And though I oftentimes wanted to participate in class, I just didn't have the tools to make my ideas seen and heard. Sometimes I needed more time to process before I was ready. Like I'm not a hand raiser. Um, And so I really looked to technology to kind of change the script to really rethink like how class time operates and how students participate in class in general. And technology to me is a tool to get to know my students on a more personal level, to connect with them on a deeper level and really empower every voice in in my classroom. And that's what I'm about. I'm about sharing that message. I'm about helping other educators see the power of technology in that way. 
I love that virtual presentation model, like you were saying, because mm -hmm. I feel like I can model it to others so they can experience it, they can feel it from the student lens. And then hopefully my, my goal is that they can do the same in their classroom, adjust it to what they need. Well, I gotta, I'm going to ask you like a very practical question in a second, because I know you got a ton of ideas on this stuff too. But when I was listening to you, and you said about how you process a little bit differently and you didn't raise your hand and things like this. Um, something I've actually been utilizing quite a bit is this process called brain writing, right? And a lot of people, we all know brainstorming. We've used it forever in education. And so I will actually just um, throw out a question or a, a few questions, especially after I give some content. And then I'll just throw up a Google form and then I'll let people process the questions before we discuss them, right? And part of the reason what I do that is because um, similar to what you said, you have wonderful ideas, but you might need a little bit more time processing, right? I will tell you this straight. And I think there's a, I want to kind of um, kill kind of like a, a, a knowledge or an idea here. I process very quickly, right? So like this podcast, I got no questions ready, whatever you say, I can, you know, come up with ideas. And it's, it's a lot of people think that someone who processes quickly is smarter, which absolutely is not true. They just might have an answer quicker. But even if someone who processes quicker has more time to reflect and think, they will actually also have better answers to questions. And I think that that's something too is that a lot of times we think that's only helping, you know, the students who might actually need more, but it actually helps everybody, right? And then and then what it leads to is that as people who might not typically actually share their thinking because they have another process now feel much more empowered because they've had time to sit and think with it. So something I've modeled uh, quite a bit and it's like, honestly, simple way is like a Google form. And this notion that, oh, kids can't talk because they're just on their phones. I'm like, well, that, some, some kids maybe, sure. But there's a ton of kids when I went to school and I'm an old guy who didn't have phones, who would never raise their hands, would never talk and but there wasn't the tools to actually bring their voices out in different ways, right? And so that's what I think, you know, you talked about was really powerful. So like when you think about this and you think about some of the strategies that you have, like what's like a practical idea of something that you've done to like, you know, maybe like a tip for somebody who's, you know, looking for a way to really, you know, bring out voices of people who are uh, of students and learners who might not typically share their voice in a classroom setting. I like that you started us off with something that was so super simple because that to me is the key, like mm -hmm. something that is simple. This doesn't have to be complex. So for me, my favorite tool is Pear Deck because it hooks up with my Google Slides. I was already using Google Slides. Now I can embed questions in my Google Slides. I can shoot out those, those um, questions ahead of time. I can say before class. I can share it in a student pace mode. I can give students time to maybe answer some of the questions. And then we bring it in class the next day. And you know what? The ones who shine when they like say it orally, they still have that opportunity. I think something really important is that we do remember, like you were kind of saying, everybody loses when we don't hear right. from everybody sure. in the room. Like there, right. the opportunity to discuss what everybody has to say. There's no way that I can replicate that same power without the technology actually. So like when I personally use Pear Deck, I like it because I can easily, you know, anonymously put everybody's answer on the board. And so now I'm creating that safety space for students. Mm -hmm. Now we we'll see everything. We see everything that everybody in the class has said. Of course, I'm only going to zone in on a couple of the answers. Like we only have so much time in class to right. do the actual discussion part. But, you know, maybe I can call out a couple answers and I call them out anonymously so many times. I find that I call out one of the answers to one of the students in class who's usually quiet. And because I'm highlighting it, now I've given them confidence and they want to respond and talk about it. Some other times it's a person who's going to be vocal about that answer is different than the one who had responded in that moment. And maybe we're hearing a different perspective. It's just such a richer form, in my opinion, of discussion. So I never say that like discussion shouldn't happen orally. I think oral discussion is super powerful. And I, it happens in every single one of my classes. But, um, you know, like, how can we give multiple platforms so that students right. can kind of express their thoughts in a way that's most comfortable to them, and help them build confidence along the way? Because I think half I'm, I'm a math teacher. So half of my challenge is always getting students to feel more, more confident once I can get them there. Right. That's right. as important as a content. 
And this is one of the things I, I, I've always appreciated about you. And I know is one of the reasons why people love your presentations is that you really started off like when we first started talking about like why these things are important, what's the, the big ideas that around them, but then you can get to the, the, like the practical, here's like a tip, here's something that you can actually do. And I find a lot of times is that um, I, I've like watched speakers go like education's broken and we need to fix it. And I'm like, Oh, give me an idea. I'm like, Oh, I don't know. It's just broke. I'm like, okay, well, Thanks for assessing that, but you're not like that didn't help anything. Right. And I think I, I, I really try to find that balance of like, Hey, like, here's some of the things I see. Here's some ideas, not, not necessarily solutions. Cause like you find the solutions, you know, your kids and you got to figure that out. And so that's something I really appreciate about kind of your approach to this, because I think sometimes if you don't address the why you're just showing the tools, what are you going to hear the whole time? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? So addressing that first really, really matters. Um, one of the things I've been talking about quite a bit lately, and I'd love your perspective on this. Uh, I have really struggled with uh, actually my own TEDx talk. I, I was, I think in 2013, I, uh, I talked about the importance of sharing our voice. And you mentioned that too. And I think we've gone to such a, such a swing of the pendulum where it was like nobody was sharing what they're doing. And now everybody's sharing what they're doing that I find nobody's listening to one another, that nobody's actually, you know, just paying attention or, you know, and it's like, we're, we're talking, uh, we're listening so we can then interject our ideas. Right. And like, maybe that's part of a podcast, I guess. Right. Cause you know, there, there, I guess there's a time and place for that, but how do you find that, that space where we teach kids not just to use their voice, but to listen to the voice of others? Yeah. You know, this is another one where I feel like here's a simple idea, but mm -hmm. I feel like we can really get that conversation going. So one of the things that I've observed, um, I love using Flipgrid for students to present and for that to really be an interactive conversation. And I think that a lot of times people even forget the power mm -hmm. of Flipgrid for that threaded conversation. But my simple idea here is like presentations that happen in the classroom tend to be very one directional. So getting everybody to stand up in the front of the room and give their presentation usually takes a couple of class days um, to get through everybody. And, you know, that person has time to answer some questions. Usually that's a presentation format. You present something, there's a little Q&A at the end. Um, what you tend to observe is that as the presentations go on longer, people ask less questions, students get a little right. bit tired of, of hearing all the presentations. Um, now, I know some people are probably listening and they're like, okay, having people stand up in the front of the room and present is a really powerful skill. I'm not gonna disagree with you. I think yep. this is something that should happen definitely in every classroom. But my thing here is like, how do we give multiple platforms and ways to assess students at different times? All right, so let's transition this to saying that instead of an in the front of the classroom, in front of the board, everybody goes up and talks, then we make them flip grid presentations. Everybody records a presentation and then it all gets posted on this grid, this flip grid. And then everybody, instead of at being required to listen to every single one, maybe you say, all right, everybody's going to listen to three different ones. Now you're giving students choice of which mm -hmm. topics they want to choose. So maybe they are really drawn to one of the subjects and now they're able to really listen to that. And they are required to give video feedback to that student who had presented. So they're engaging with it. They're talking through it. And they're required to, if they have to watch three of them, give three meaningful responses. And they're being assessed in a way on mm -hmm. that critique that they're able to give or that thought. So in this way, first of all, you're giving those students who might present better on a flip grid, maybe it's because they want to write out a script and they're reading it as they're recording. Maybe it's because they're creative on video and they're going to add mm -hmm. in all these cool elements that you would never even know and see about the student. So you're giving them the opportunity when they're presenting. And then when you're doing the, you know, the sharing out and students are learning from one another, you're giving them more choice as to which ones they engage with. And again, an opportunity to learn about like, oh, what are your mm -hmm. students choosing? Um, what are they really interested in? And, um, and you're still really 
you know, giving that conversational piece. And I think it can be more powerful in ways. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love that because it is that is like embedded listening into the process and and like learning to respond and connect right like i remember um years ago we we actually did this thing called digital parent volunteers and so parents that wanted to volunteer in their kids classroom that couldn't physically be there they would actually uh, respond to comments on blogs um, yeah. or they would respond to blogs and they write comments right and so one of the things that we did with the parents which was really cool was we made them take a, like a little short course before they were allowed to to be the digital parent volunteer. And they actually had to learn to write comments to encourage. So you couldn't just say, Hey, great job. It's like, what would kids say to that? So it was like, how do you actually, you know, uh, respond to something uh, and then, you know, get more information of the, the students so that they can actually respond more. So it wasn't just you would respond to your kid's blog, you were responding to, and kids were excited about that. And then the kids would learn to respond back and kind of go back and forth. And it was really, it was really powerful, you know, w way to see this. And, and uh, one of the, I talked about this with a group and what was really cool is that um, a teacher reached out to me and she said, Hey, uh, where did you get those modules from that taught the parents? And I, I was like in the middle of a presentation and 10 minutes later, she responded and said, Hey, don't even worry about it. Our kids are going to actually teach the parents how to appropriately comment on our blogs. So the kids did these little mini tutorial videos saying, Hey, make sure that you're thoughtful that you can't see someone on the screen. And they were like, kind of saying like, Hey, parents here's how to uh, here's how to interact online which i thought was amazing right because they're kind of like you're kind of bad sometimes so you got to kind of figure out how to to be nice to people on the internet so i, I love that so great great example i i gotta ask you this so did you say you you were an economist that was that what you were doing before so t yeah. tell me uh, tell us tell us what that is because like this is what i love about doing the podcast like i would have never known that so tell me a little bit about that that time yeah I always loved math and I wanted to study applied math. And that was what I did. Like I loved economics in school. I actually really was into behavioral economics. So I think that's where I love teaching. And I love, I love just trying to get into people's heads and like thinking about how they <laughs> react. And, you know, like there's a very mathematical interpretation of this in the economics world. Um, so I got really into that and I went to grad school. I studied more economics. And then when I went into the working world, it wasn't exactly the same. Um, mm. It wasn't exactly like the same like behavioral type of stuff. And it, it was what I also what I went into. It's just more of like, me being behind a computer and doing spreadsheets all day, right. which I learned right. a lot of cool skills. But um, yeah, I think I always have enjoyed understanding people. And I just also love math. So I was trying to tie the two things together. It was very successful in my schooling, it wasn't so successful for me in the working world. Huh. And then I became a math teacher. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, so let's just, let's just take math out of it right now. And I want to, so what did you learn that a teacher teaching any subject that you think that you could learn from your background as an economist? Not don't say math stuff, right? Like what was some of the things that you learned? Cause obviously the math connections, well, it's easy for you, but not me because I'm not very good at math, but maybe that's why I'm asking the way I am. But like, what, like what, what did you learn from that process that you think any teacher could apply? I mean, is this a answer? I, it's like the problem solving skills because there were so many things okay. that like, you know, I was like building these Excel spreadsheets. I didn't quite learn exactly that in school. Right. Um, right. So I like reverse engineered a lot of things. I would like find things and then I would figure out like how that was made and then I would make something from it. So that was like how I learned and how I was successful in that role. It was like a lot of researching and a lot of reverse engineering things. And I think that's just really applied moving forward. And I think that one of my big successes with um, tech tools in general has been that I try and not just like look at something that somebody else has done with that tool and replicate mm -hmm. it, but really that idea of like remixing it and making it my own. So um, a lot of these tech tools that I've seen, like, you know, I, as a math teacher, a lot of math teachers weren't using them when I was, at least when I was starting with them mm -hmm. and um, you know, just thinking about like, how does it apply to a math 
classroom. Um, how, you know, when you see like, you see so many English teachers doing it. How right. does this like same thing, a discussion-based video, a flip grid, like how does that apply to a math classroom? But it was, it's been a game changer in my math classroom, you know? So sometimes you just have to kind of, I think the reverse engineering. Well, it's it, that so that that's a great answer, and the reason I love that so much is because uh, your background's not like a lot of people see the work that you're doing, like, well, you must have taken technology in college, blah blah blah. I never took anything in technology. I was actually very anti-technology in college. I remember they. This is how old I am. They made us pay fifty dollars for an email account in my last year of university. And I basically started a protest. I was like, "How dare you make me use this email stuff? This electronic mail. I'm not using it." Like, what's this? What use is this? I remember actually, like, literally being on like on a protest about it, and so I was so mad. Like, fifty dollars is a lot, right? Yeah. When you're in university, and the thing that I think you is, I always kind of wonder about this when people say, "Like, I'm not good with tech." I'm like, mm, you're just maybe not good with sticking with things. Are you maybe not good with you know pressing buttons? Because I think a lot of times they it's just like they see it and they're like they're done. Really, how I've learned stuff is I, you know, even even to like, you know, we're using StreamYard right now. And I saw other people using it. I'm like, well, they figured it out. So I'm going to sign up. And like, if you can't sign up, you shouldn't be able to teach because basically it's fill in blanks. Here's where you put your name. You put your name in the name part. Yeah. And then once you get to that, once you get to the sign up, then you just kind of start looking for buttons, right? Like that's always trick. Like, hey, you want to you wanna learn how to like embed code? Look for the embed button. That's the first thing you do. It's a, it's a trick every time, right? So I, I love that because I think it's not necessarily I'm bad with tech. It's that I just I don't I don't want to bother, right? And and that that that's always something, you know, people that are willing to learn and, and develop will always grow, right? Which is I think is really powerful. Um, so tell us about, and you've done such a great job kind of like giving us examples. And kind of living this book, but like talk about Tech with Heart, your book specifically. Tell us what it's about. Um, you know, like what what would a reader expect from from reading your book? Yeah, so I tried to keep it really true to me, and it is very much my personal journey. So you know, it mm -hmm. starts with like who I was as a student, how that's influenced um, the teacher that I've become. Um, and it is very much about understanding the different types of learners that we have. I, you know, I talk a bit about my own personal struggles um, as a student. Um, and a lot of it, you know, you had referred to this before about like being the quicker one. And I oftentimes felt like those students who were quicker than me, that faster was better, they were smarter. Um, right. It didn't matter that I was getting A's in my classes, I still felt like I wasn't measuring up. And it really, really did take a toll on me, especially I, just some, my personality and very much a perfectionist. And I always wanted to like do better and be better. Right. And um, it took a really big toll on me. Um, and you know, now we talk more about mental health, and we talk more about like the whole child mm -hmm. wellness. That is a big goal of my book. Um, getting people to start thinking about that. And I want people to be able to apply whatever I'm saying to themselves. Um, but I share what I've gone through. And then, you know, so after that, I talk about flipping my classroom because to me, that was like the beginning of everything for me. Mm -hmm. I started flipping my classroom in 2010. And why did I start doing that? You know what? The flip classroom wasn't even a thing yet. And it was, it worked so well for me because number one, I wasn't trying to do anything specifically that somebody else was doing, but I started with a problem. I didn't have enough time in my classroom to get around to all my students. I wanted to have more time, wanted to make more meaningful use of face-to-face -face time. And that was where I offloaded that like very teacher directed lecture to video. And I was able to free up class time. And that was the goal for me. And then I go into this journey of like onboarding more technology. And I actually lay out in the book an eight year timeline from like when I started that 2010 mm. to when my book was published. And I talk about, because I think people get very oftentimes they look at like what I do and they're like, oh my God, I, you know, that's just so much. Yeah. But it took me eight years. Like it was a progression. And right. every year I really picked one thing. I started small. When I made my videos, I took all my time making videos. I knew it was going to take me a lot of time. The next year I thought about how it was using class time. The next year I started rolling it out with another class and I started embedding questions into the quizzes. I love using a lot of technology tools. And I really only talk about three of them in my book. And those have been like the three 
it doesn't have to be those three tools, but it's those three right. ideas that I want people to be able to like, you know, see and understand and maybe that fits into what they're doing. You don't have to use everything. Like start slow. Every year for me, it was one goal. When I started teaching my online class, my goal was really like, how can I develop the deepest relationships with my students in this online format? And my answer started being, okay, I'm going to start using Slack with them so that we can chat more, you know, freely. Right. And secondly, that I'm going to do Flipgrid videos where we just do private check-ins because we can't always sit one-on-one -on -one together. So let's make it asynchronous right. and let's still right. connect with our video. That was it. That was like the simple goal, but it led to so much that year. Yeah. And your, your focus is something I really appreciate because the the idea of less is more is really powerful because it's not that you're doing less quality you're using less tools to go deeper and i think that's what really matters i think a lot of times we're always just jumping on the latest and greatest thing but we never get good at anything right so that 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 focus so i'm i you kind of mentioned a couple of tools and you said there's three tools that you use i'm not going to ask you what they are because you're gonna have to read tech with heart to <laughs> actually find out the three tools if you want to know what they are you got to get the book. So that, I'm going to suggest that. So last question I got for you. And this is, I, I was actually going to, I've been asking this for the last couple of podcasts. So this is uh, being recorded in March. It's going to be out in Maple or Maple. I just made up a month. So it's going to be out in May or June. So uh, a lot of people are either going on spring or sorry, summer break. They're either on break. So typically a good question to ask is like, so what should we do for next year? But I'm actually not going to ask that. What are you doing on your break? What are you doing when you have some of that time, you know, like before next year? Tell me about that. Like, or maybe what's something you suggest to people and do not make it work related. What's something that you got? What's something you got? Like maybe something you're going to do coming up. Yeah. So I think there's two things for me that as I've gotten older that I've realized one is the importance of giving yourself just the white space to think. Um, because I really feel that's where creativity soars. And if we don't give ourselves time to just be and just think, then those creative ideas just never flourish. And so creating that rest time, and I'm a person that likes to always be like creating and doing and sometimes it's hard to remember to kind of, you know, shut it down for a minute and just let my right. brain <laughs> explore. And so that's one thing is, is giving that time for rest because mm -hmm. to me, like rest breeds creativity. And then the second thing is just the power of writing and sometimes just writing whatever, like not writing with anything in mind. Um, I'll tell you that I never set out to write a book ever. The book just ended up happening because it came from like blog posts that I had written. And then people would like reach out and ask me like, well, how does this really work? And I realized, like, I didn't have, you know, it was just a blog post in a moment, like how to really piece all these things together. And then I realized, well, I really need to tell my story to make this all like to make people be able to connect to it. But let me get back to your question, which was like the writing, just the power of just sitting and writing. I like to do like morning pages. Um, where I just like jot everything down and I just try and make it like a stream of consciousness and I don't edit myself or revise myself and I just let it flow. And I think that's really powerful for me personally to get like for my own personal wellness and health um, because you just get out like some bad thoughts and you see it on paper mm -hmm. and you're able to process it in that way. Um, but also just like a reflective, like the power of the reflection on when, when you write. And that writing doesn't have to be shared with anybody, um, but it can be. And sometimes it's really powerful right. when we can share it because people learn so much from us. Well, it, it's funny you say that because this podcast um, actually came out of me intentionally taking a break between December and January, where I'm like, I'm not making anything. I need to like just take some time. And then all of a sudden, all these ideas started popping out of my head. There's actually, I'm going to encourage people to Google this because I, I remember writing about it, but I can't, I can't remember the exact, but there's like this idea of like, you get ideas when you're in the shower. So there's actually some scientific reason that actually happens, right? 
And so like it, it is talking about what you're talking about is because you, you, you actually step away and you don't think about things and then things just start coming at you. Right. And they start thinking about that. So I, I love that advice because, um, I've had a couple books come out of this. I've had a uh, podcast and you know, if it wasn't for me taking that break, having a podcast, I would have never been able to finally meet you here today and to be able to have this time and, uh, to chat with you and, uh, anyone who's listening, you can tell us Stacy's absolutely amazing. She's got a ton of great ideas. So make sure you connect with her. Uh, on Twitter at BuddyXO. Check out her book, Tech With Heart. And Stacey, thanks so much for being on. Like, thanks for taking the time out of your day because I know, like, you're you're busy. It's, you know, you're on the East Coast, so it's like 11 p.m. or something because the East Coast is the worst time zone of all time, right? Uh, I don't know. I like right? the night, so I don't mind. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're trying to watch anything on the West Coast, the basketball game, it's like 3 in the morning <laughs> or something crazy, crazy like that. But Stacey, it is so awesome to... You know what I'm going to do, Stacey, for you being on? It was awesome to meet you and just for doing awesome work. <laughs> i do one more soundboard for you, but... Hey everyone, thanks for listening. Stacey, thanks so much for being on. Make sure you connect with her and uh, check out uh, Tech With Heart. So thanks everyone for listening. Have a wonderful day.